Uh, I'm the communications coordinator at AFOP Health and Safety and Children in the Fields campaign. We're here today with uh, Dr. Medeiros and Amy K. Liebman from Migrant Clinicians Network. And today we're hosting a very important conversation about coronavirus. Um, we're going to give people a few minutes to join until about 1233, just to make sure everyone can see us. Go ahead and um, open us up. Put some questions in the chat window if you have any. We'll have a time for questions at the end if we have uh, any that come in. Feel free to put those in to the comments. Kendra, I'm getting us a little bit of feedback, I think, when you're on now. So when you're not talking, just, just mute. Great. Yeah, I got that. I'll do that. I didn't, I'm not hearing it now. When I'm talking, I don't hear it at all, so. Okay. Okay. Is it better if I do it without the headphones? No, headphones are better, actually. Okay. Do you, do you see the little mute button, Laz, on your, um, where it says you're in stream? If you look at that box down there, yeah. when you're not talking, you can mute it. Okay. okay. We'll give everyone another minute to join us. This is Facebook Live uh, with Children in the Fields campaign. My name is Kendra Mosley. We're gonna talk about coronavirus and its impact on farm workers. I think we have enough people here now that we'll get started. Um, so I'll just start us off. The coronavirus has a lot of people housebound right now um, to prevent the spread of the virus. Um, but as we all know, farm workers don't really have that luxury <laughs> at all. We depend on them actually to go to work um, and to keep the grocery stores full in just such a time as this. Um, and at the same time, they don't have access to the tools and resources that a lot of the rest of us do have to pre prevent them from getting sick or to help them get better quickly. Um, so we invited a couple of guests to join us today uh, to talk about that. So we have Dr. Laszlo Medeiros, and Amy K. Liebman from Migrant Clinicians Network. Welcome. We're so happy you can join us. Um, just to let you know, Dr. Medeiros is a hospitalist and he could be called away at any point um, to uh, fulfill his duties. And we understand that that happens and Amy will, will just step in if that happens. So um, we'll get started. I just wanna introduce you properly. So Dr. Medeiros is the Chief Medical Officer for Migrant Clinicians Network. Um, he's responsible for the oversight of MCN clinical activities. And Dr. Medeiros has worked all over the world, including serving as a Peace Corps volunteer in Africa. Since 1996, Dr. Dr. Medeiros has worked in both inpatient and outpatient medicine in rural Pennsylvania, including serving as the assistant medical director at the Keystone Community Health Center from 2001 to 2005, where he cared for migrant farm workers and their families. In addition to his work with MCN, Dr. Medeiros works part-time at the hospitalist serves as a staff physician in Pennsylvania Tuberculosis Control Program, and he teaches medical students, so full plate. Um, Amy K. Liebman, MPA MA, has devoted her career to improving the safety and health of farm workers and other disenfranchised populations. She has served as Margaret Clinician Network's Director of, en of Environmental and Occupational Health, sorry, <laughs> since 1999, establishing nationally recognized training and technical assistance programs for community groups and health centers throughout the country. She advocates for improved policies to protect workers and immigrant families and has spearheaded several national efforts, including strengthening the worker protection standard, a key federal regulation that protects farm workers from pesticide exposure. So welcome, Laz and Amy. We are so happy you can join us. Thank you, good to be here. Good to be here, thank you. So we'll start off uh, with the questions that we have prepared. Um, so the first question is the, the basic one. What is COVID-19 and how is it spread? 
Okay. So welcome everybody. Um, and um, I'm really glad to can, uh, get a chance to talk today. This is a very important topic on everybody's mind right now. So COVID-19 is the name of one uh, coronavirus uh, in a family of coronaviruses. Corona just means crown. And this is the way that the, that the virus looks under a microscope. Um, so coronaviruses have been in our past. We had in 2002 SARS and in 2012 MERS, which are variants of coronavirus. This is a completely new virus that we're encountering right now, and it is spreading faster than most of the other viruses that we've encountered in recent decades and probably maybe even recent centuries. Um, it affects many more people than the previous viruses also, which makes it you know, something worthy of our attention right now. Um, there are many other types of viruses out there, and uh, some of those include influenza, the common flu, and uh, common cold viruses and other types of viruses. So our winter in the northern hemisphere is, is full of different kinds of viruses. This one is a new player, and it is more deadly than the influenza virus, um, but uh, it's we can manage it in similar ways as we manage uh, influenza. And I'll get into that in just a minute. Um, so it is spread. I'm not sure if there's going to be a question here, but how is it spread? I'm going to say it's spread person to person through uh, direct contact with common activities like uh, shaking hands, hugging. Um, if you sneeze on your hand and you have the coronavirus, you shake somebody else's hand, well, it's spread through direct contact that way also. If you take that person's hand and you don't wash your hands before touching your eyes or your nose or your mouth. The uh, coronavirus enters directly into your oropharynx, your mouth, and that's how it is spread uh, in um, the general way. Um, to our, the best of our knowledge, it is not traveling through the air more than six feet. This is why some of the recommendations are to stay six feet apart. Um, it's a question whether it can stay on surfaces longer than a couple of hours. Right now, those studies are showing possibly a day or two. Um, and that's just evolving information right now. So we'll be learning more about that in the coming days. So it's really important to take a couple of steps to prevent the spread of this virus, very similar to how to, to prevent spread of other viruses. So one, uh, wash your hands with soap and water for at least 20 seconds. Some studies are saying maybe a little bit longer, but for right now, the CDC recommendation are 20 seconds. Uh, two, you can use hand sanitizer, which is... Uh, hopefully 60% or higher alcohol content if soap and water are not available. I know there's a lot of communities out there panicking and getting lots of uh, hand sanitizer, but if you, if you run out and your store doesn't have it, don't worry, soap and water are very good. So keep doing the soap and water washing. Three, what we talked about before, social distancing. Stay at least uh, six feet apart from other people. We're gonna talk about this, how it relates to farm workers a little bit later in the discussion here, but the recommendation is six feet apart from uh, the next person. And then if you're sneezing, uh, use a coughing adequate. Sneeze into your shoulder like that or have a Kleenex, uh, some tissue, and then throw it away right away. Don't carry it around with you. Um, you can also clean surfaces regularly. The CDC recommends bleach and water currently. Um, there may be other things out there, but CDC recommends bleach and water. So we're going to just try to give you the information that the CDC's providing right now. So those are different ways of trying to prevent the spread. Okay. Great. Thank you, Les. Um, again, this is the Children in the Fields Live Thursday. We're here with Dr. Medeiros and Amy Liebman from Migrant Clinicians Network, if you've just joined us. Um, the next question is also for Dr. Medeiros. What should we be concerned about in the rural communities where the farm workers uh, primarily reside? Okay. Very good. So COVID-19, <clears throat> Again, as a virus, it's spread in the same way as um, other viruses, regardless of the community you're in, whether urban or rural. So one of the things that we do uh, have, and I'll just go over the differences between rural and urban at this point. So in a rural population, you have a great deal of elderly, and they're sometimes uh, grouped together in, in families, and uh, many of them have pre-existing conditions. As you get older, you tend to collect various uh, conditions such as hypertension, COPD, um, and so these are these are uh, conditions that put you more at risk if you get the virus that you're going to have a worse outcome, get sicker, possibly even die. So 
a higher percentage of elderly live in rural areas for work. Two, there's also uh, more smokers in rural areas proportionally, especially in the United States. That may not be true for European countries as much, but in, in the United States, there's more smokers. And uh, smoking over many decades can put your lungs at risk because you're, you're starting off already uh, a little bit compromised. So again, this virus hits you a little bit harder. It's not a death sentence by any means for a smoker, so I don't want people to panic who are smoking, but it is. it does put you a little bit more compromised position. Um, in rural areas also, <clears throat> healthcare is sometimes hard to, uh, to uh, get to. Sometimes you have to travel miles and miles, and so farm workers may be hesitant to travel longer distances unless it's like really, really serious. And sometimes they may wait a little bit longer than they should because it's a farther distance to go to a, a, a rural hospital in a rural setting. So that's another geographic concern in rural communities. Another thing that I know, having worked in rural communities and um, having worked in smaller hospitals in rural communities, is that um, the staff, the rooms, the ICU beds particularly, are often uh, very limited and fill up quickly in the case of an epidemic. And so even if we have excellent staff, which in our hospitals we do, um, the, they may be understaffed and rapidly exhausted um, and overwhelm even the best, you know, best trained staff. So these are all conditions that in rural communities you have to be uh, cognizant of and uh, make sure that uh, if, you're, if your worker is sick, these are challenges to, to the rural communities that urban communities may not have. But by and large, just remember that the, the virus spreads in, in all different communities, rural, urban, and all different uh, genders and et cetera. So it's all of us are at risk. Thank you, Dr. Medeiros. Um, if you're just joining us again, this is Facebook Live with Children in the Fields campaign. We have Dr. Medeiros and Amy Liebman from Migrant Clinicians Network joining us. Um, so the next question is, what are the concerns that are specific to farm workers? And that's for you, Amy. All right, thanks. Um, and welcome everyone who's, who's joining us. Um, so we at, at Migrant Clinicians Network, along with um, many other farm worker groups across the country, we're extremely concerned about our farm worker community right now. Um, we know that even when we are not in a crisis, our farm workers um, face, are vulnerable and face a lot of challenges. Um, specifically right now, we're concerned uh, about the potential for our farm workers for losing work and lost wages um, and serious consequences that follow. Um, we uh, are worried about potential uh, that they don't have workers unemployment compensation, uh, their limited access to health care insurance and their inability to become insured, uh, lack of access to health care, lack of child care, um, we're concerned, and we'll get to this more in a minute, about potential for unsanitary crowded housing. Um, we're concerned about the fact that they don't have paid sick leave. Um, we all, on a regular day, um, even when we're not in this unprecedented crisis, there's the impacts of our broken immigration system and uh, our, our farm workers that might have differing status. Uh, we're concerned about varying threats for, for immigration enforcement. Um, there's a lot of uncertainty right now among uh, agriculture workers that are, are coming through on the H-2A visa program. Um, we're hearing uh, uh, different things, um, but um, we do know that there's gonna be some challenges, limitations, and um, potential temporary um, suspensions. And then, you know, we're also, and we worry about this um, all the time as well, um, but particularly with this, this virus, we're worried about the lack of access to accurate, timely um, information that, that's in appropriate languages. And we're concerned, um, as we are about everyone else, but also for our farmer community, about the, the stress and anxiety that this particular virus is, uh, can cause. Thank you, Amy. Um, given these concerns and the recommendations to prevent the spread, how can we help farm workers, particularly when their housing often means they're living right on top of each other? Yeah, and, and so um, we, we have heard throughout some of the information on, on the virus that 
the outdoors is a great disinfectant. And I, I think we need to be sure that we're not romanticizing uh, the work and the lives of farm workers um, because housing is one of the more challenging concerns and given the structure of our system, really hard to address. Um, but, and a lot of the things that we're, we're saying about our farm worker community are really hard to address. We understand very well the challenges, but we need to also look at that, that it's not, not impossible. Um, and we have a lot that we're going to learn from the TB community that has been addressing airborne illnesses um, and workers um, for a long time. So we're, we're looking um, a lot to some lessons learned from the TB community. Um, we also know that um, in, a, in addition to, on one hand, we're worried about potential unemployment. At the same time, we know um, that workers are going to be in high demand, particularly if there are going to be limitations on, on the visa. Um, so we have an opportunity uh, to potentially have recognized the need for the certain protections um, for our farm workers because what we do to help our farm workers will help our farmers and will help us and ultimately get to um, our, our community. So um, Dr. Madeiras just listed the various hygiene measures that are really important and farm workers need information about those um, hygiene measures and how to, you know, washing their hands, the social distancing and the isolation. Um, and so, and so training and, and resources for them um, are needed. Um, we also need um, the resources for them to be able to implement hygiene measures. Um, so workers need to be provided with soap and place to wash their hands regularly. For their housing, sleeping arrangements need to be made so that workers can be at least six feet apart. I know that some of you may think, well, that's, that's near impossible. These are the things as advocates that we need to be demanding. Um, we need to make sure that farm worker housing, just like our housing, is regularly disinfected. And, and again, this is a part of our, our greater conversation that we're having in our community right now, but farm workers, farm workers like, like other workers, should be provided um, with, with, with sick leave. So um, provisions need to be made. Sick workers um, need to be separated. Um, sick workers um, need to be compensated for, for their leave. Um, and uh, sick workers need to be um, given access to, to healthcare. So I know that when we look on a regular day, what I'm saying are, are, is very challenging. I wanna keep stressing that. But the measures that we need to keep our farm workers safe are, are more important than ever, and that's what we need to be to be advocating for. Definitely, um, Amy. How can growers protect their farm workers? What what can they do? Great. So, just like for our public health and our greater community, like protecting farm workers is, is in all of our interests, and and growers have obviously an economic incentive. Um, OSHA uh, has some important resources available um, for agricultural employers um, that they can adapt for their workers. But some of the steps that we've been mentioning, um, these are the steps that growers um, can, can take. Um, so when it comes to housing and, and hygiene, they're really important. And also I wanna throw in transportation. Often farm workers are put in scenarios where they're, they're in very crowded transportation. and and adjustments need to be made and, and disinfection measures need, need to be implemented. Again, I'm gonna um, underscore that, that um, employers um, have a real important role to play in here. And just like other employers um, what it, um, that are dealing with sick worker, paid sick leave is, is a public health issue. And we really don't want our workers um, to feel pressure when they sick when they're sick, so fighting for paid sick leave is, is needed. Um, access to healthcare workers must be provided the transportation and the resources to seek healthcare. Um, promoting policies of, of wellness if a worker feels ill, they they need to be encouraged to, to not work. And so again, I sound like a broken record. I know I know um, some of these policies are are challenging in regular times. 
um, but potentially the crisis offers us an opportunity to keep fighting for um, the public health um, that will benefit um, our farm workers, our farmers, and ultimately allow us to get the produce that we need um, from the farm to the table. Absolutely. Um, if you're just joining us again, this is Kendra Mosley from AFOP Health and, Health and Safety Children in the Fields Campaign. Um, I'm joined by Migrant Clinicians, Clinicians Network, Dr. Medeiros and Amy Liebman. Um, and we're talking about the impact of the coronavirus on our farm worker communities. Um, and I've had a few questions come in about um, whether or not this will be recorded. I assure you it will, and it is, and we will um, post that video after it's over. Um, so the next question that I have is, uh, what should be done if a farm worker gets sick? And we know that that is really an eventuality. So when a farm worker gets sick? So yeah, when, when the farm worker gets sick, it's really important to try to isolate that farm worker from the other workers right away. If you're showing symptoms, certainly this could be the coronavirus, COVID-19, it could be influenza, it could be any one of a number of viral infections. You won't know that at the moment, but once you know that your farm worker is sick, you should be isolated from the other farm workers so that not everybody gets that you know, right away. Now, just what Amy said, <clears throat> if we had that infrastructure where we had transportation, everything else, I'm, I'm hoping that that is the case because I do believe that this is very important for the people who make our food. And so what we need to do in this situation is um, house them in an area that's, that has independent uh, housing, not in contact with everybody else sharing the same rooms, the same kitchen, the same supplies, and then get them to a medical provider. Now, we should call the medical provider ahead of time. Don't just show up in the office with this person who is potentially going to infect other people there. Call them ahead. Some places are providing uh, tents outside of the actual clinic building to check on people to make sure that they have certain criteria. So those criteria would be at this point a fever and one of two other things, a shortness of breath or um, a cough. And if they have those criteria, <clears throat> most likely they'll be, they'll be tested. Again, this varies from, from state to state and county to county because not everybody has the access to the testing at this time. <clears throat> you should also not take a public transportation to the, the clinic. So don't take a bus or train, et cetera. It's better to go in a private vehicle. You can go by ambulance if the patient's really sick, but a, pri a personal vehicle would be adequate to take the patient to the clinic and then clean everything off with Clorox afterwards. But that's much better than trying to take public transportation. And then when they're being diagnosed, if they're being quarantined for a while, again, put them back into a place where they're not making contact with the other farm workers. And then make sure you have enough food and water for the, that farmer because that uh, worker may not have access to a store very easily, nor should they be shopping around in a, in a local food store. So make sure there's enough food and water there so they can be quarantined for the designated amount of time. So that's another important uh, consideration. And ideally, the, the growers will provide something for the, for the workers because to get two to three weeks of food supply may not be affordable to most people who are living pretty much week to week, paycheck to paycheck. So it's important to be able to give them a little bit extra funding to make that make that happen. And then monitor for the symptoms. If things get even worse, they may have to go to the hospital. Currently, what, what we read is about 20% of the, the coronavirus COVID-19 uh, patients need to be hospitalized at some point. Now that data is changing. You have to understand that this Information is changing weekly, almost daily, sometimes even hourly. But about one fifth of the, the patients who are sick may need to go to the hospital at some point. Doesn't mean they need to stay there for a long period of time, but they may need extra help in, in getting better. So, those are things that you should do uh, immediately if you suspect your farm worker has uh, a viral illness, which could possibly be COVID 19. If you're now, if your if your um, worker is diagnosed with it, for sure, you have to uh, notify your health department, and they can give you instructions what to do locally. It may be there may be regional differences. Again, there's maybe long distances between areas in, in rural parts of the country uh, versus uh, East Coast or West Coast. Um, there may be differences in what the health departments would recommend there. But um, what you need to do then is to instruct all the other contacts that that worker had. 
um, close contacts with this particular uh, uh, worker, and then self-monitor for the symptoms for at least the next 14 days. And so that's going to be really important. And how that's done, you know, hopefully you have a ledger or some kind of book or something like that. You can put everybody's name in there who's been contacted and the date that, that was noted and then go out 14 days so everybody knows when the quarantine should end. Um, these exposed workers then should be separated from the non-exposed workers also. So now you have the one person who has been, who's definitely the case, and then you have the, the, um, the first contacts, and those should be isolated also. We've done some of this in tuberculosis control for many years. We have multi-resistant tuberculosis around the world, and we have an excellent team in the United States uh, that I've had the privilege of working with for many years now uh, who do contact investigation. So we're going to be learning from some things that we already know from other uh, infectious diseases in terms of isolation. So I wanted to reassure everybody that the best minds are, are working on this, not just in the United States, but globally. It's a, it's a pandemic and everybody's you know, working on this. Um, um, so after 14 days, if uh, there's no infection, the farm workers should be allowed to return um, and uh, checked again by a healthcare worker and then cleared. Uh, sometimes, you know, there'd be other things that they can pick up. Sometimes you get better. Sometimes there's an overlying bacterial pneumonia that kind of rides on top of the viral infection. So it, it should be checked out again uh, after 14 days before allowing that worker to go back to the, to the community. Okay. That's good to know. Thank you, Dr. Medeiros. Um, and uh, I was just, you know, we're inundated with so much information, but I feel like that really does help reduce panic. The more that we know, um, the, the more we can be prepared. Um, so if you're all joining us, this is Children in the Fields Live Thursday. We're here with Dr. Medeiros and Amy Liebman from Migrant Clinicians Network. Um, so the next question we have for you is, uh, will migrant clinics be providing COVID-19 testing? Yeah, so that's a, that's a hard question right now because our supplies are still limited. I work in the hospital right now, and even our supplies, you know, we have some supplies, but we send them out to labs outside of the hospital right now. And it takes sometimes days to get back. So I know that there's variations in the country, and I don't have the knowledge base right now to address every community and every state of, of our country right now. The, the government is working on trying to get more and more testing kits. Um, so what I what I recommend, and our expertise at Margaret Business Network is working with community health centers. The community health centers, you know, know their populations, and they're usually based in areas of need. Many of them were initiated working with farm workers. And so they have they have already an expertise in that population. So um, what I'm hoping to see is that the community health centers will have access to testing kits, and then we will be able to test you know, more people as they come to the rural communities. So that not everybody has to go to a central, you know, urban setting to try to get uh, tested. And the more people can do less travel, the better. Um, so each state and community is going to have to look and. I refer you to your state health department. Again, they're working on this right now. That's their top priority. It's been you know, put at the very top of everything that each state health department is working on right now. Um, but I believe that the community health center is gonna be key in helping uh, farm workers get the testing and the treatments and the advice. And the community health workers there too are keeping up to date with all this information. In fact, that's part of the, our goal at Microsoft Network is to keep them updated as well so they can help the farmer across the country. So can I, can I jump in here? Just, I want to um, underscore. So there's a number of places um, at the Migrant Clinician Network website, as well as um, the Health Resources Service Administration, where you can go online and find the nearest community health center. Um, they will be a resource for our, our growers and our farm workers um, in um, directing them uh, where, where to go for services. Um, and then understanding uh, the, the, the local, it's really important to understand your local infrastructure because we're, we're very decentralized and it's going, going to vary. But our, our community health centers, and you know that some are already set up to do testing, uh, other, others are not. So it's, it's going to vary and you really need to understand what's happening locally. Thank you, Amy. Um, I have another question for you. Sorry, there's a little bit of feedback. 
Um, what resources are available for agricultural workers and employ employers? So uh, we've seen so many resources and I think all of us are, are overwhelmed and underwhelmed at the same time because we're not necessarily sure where we can go specifically for resources um, that will help our farm worker community that um, by and large have limited formal education and may have um, low levels of, of literacy. So we at MCN, we have you know, tried to sort of distill some of that for you and we, we have some of those resources on our website. In particular, um, the CDC and the World Health Organization have some very good um, infographics in, in multiple languages um, that, that we're uh, recommending. And again, what uh, I want to encourage all of our, our advocates and outreach workers and community health workers that are, are, are listening is to just remember our, our audience, remember our farm workers and, and recognizing, you know, what kind of information they might be able to digest. So, so thinking about literacy levels, thinking about formal education levels and keeping messages really simple. And I, I think for the general public, we, we actually really need to be keeping consistent messages and keep it simple um, because there are clear steps that we as individuals, whether we're a farm worker, whether we're a grower, whether we're a mom, um, that we, we all all can be taken. So um, I, I, feel, I feel like that, that OSHA, OSHA information for the uh, ag employers is really important. And then um, some of the information from CDC and WHO and MCN um, has done a couple of blogs where we've mentioned uh, these um, particular resources. And now um, hopefully we, we have them all um, up on our, our website. Great. Um, I'm just going to include one more, one of those questions that we had on, um, on the COVID-19 and whether or not it can be spread to produce. I think that's the one that a lot of people are, are asking. Sure. And that, that's a hard question right now, because as we're getting this information that it can survive for, for hours to days on surfaces. So there's a potential for that happening on produce that you can't wash or can't peel. So that, that may be a challenge. I don't know at this point, I was trying to do research on that and I think that's an evolving topic. So if you eat an apple, peel it. Obviously a banana, you peel it, but there's um, certain things that, that you can wash. Um, I, I don't know how, how that's gonna you know, play out. I think in the dairy market, it should be okay, but there's, there's, um, there's a lot of questions still that we're, we're trying to get answers to there. I don't know if Amy, if, if you had a chance to look at any other resources on that, because I knew that was going to be a question and I just don't have anything solid. And, and uh, like Amy said, we're really, we're really trying to spread information that is correct and uh, factual up to date. There's a lot of information out there and we don't want to spread things that are not factual, or the best of the, you know, the best of our knowledge uh, information. I don't really have any more information on that, but Amy, I don't know if you have right. any. Yeah, we, we did take a, a look at this and it is um, a changing, it's, it's just changing um, with more information coming out about how long the viruses last on certain, surface, uh, certain surfaces. Right now, um, there isn't any evidence that's suggesting that it's gonna stay on your food. Um, and, but again, what we need to do is take a step back and continuing our safe hygiene measures so it would be to um, making sure that we're washing our fruits and vegetables less, made a suggestion of peeling them, which is, which is great. Um, and then wash, washing our hands. But right, right now, we, we don't have any evidence um, that it stays on produce. The good thing that we have in our favor is that the outdoors is a, is a, is a good disinfectant. Um, but again, this is, this is a rapidly changing conversation. Yeah, and that's another good thing to remember that uh, we just need to keep paying attention and, and updating um, all of our information. Um, so just one more question before we move into question and answer from the audience, and that's for Dr. Medeiros. How will COVID-19 affect the agricultural business and how should growers prepare? Okay, yeah. So I'll give you the, the bad news first and I'll give you some good news here. 
So there's substantial uh, potential for the agricultural commodity market with losses of crops, milk, et cetera, uh, from workers because they're not available because they're sick. And that, that could really lead to some devastation of our, of our produce. And that's why, that's why we're here right now talking about this because you know, every, every American citizen is important. Every worker is important, what, what they do. But our farm workers make the produce that we eat. And so, and we can't, that's, you know, that's not an optional kind of thing. We have to eat every day. So these are the producers who make our food, who bring it to the table. So it's really vital that we work together to keep them protected safe and able to continue the important work that they do. So if we have suspension of, of certain services or this concern that the food uh, chain is tainted somehow, that will lead to a lot of devastating results in, in our agricultural community. So that's the bad news. The good news is that I believe that what we just talked about, we, we can reduce the uh, transmissions. Okay, we're, we're getting some good news out of Wuhan right now. I have a colleague who is working there with the WHO out of Geneva, and he is working on, on this transmission issue. And they're seeing some light at the end of the tunnel in Wuhan right now. So there is potential that the things we're asking Americans to do right now, which is quite a lot of sacrificing, but I think in the end will be ultimately worthwhile. I think these are gonna help protect uh, in reducing the viral transmission uh, to our farm workers and, and to our fellow Americans. Um, and so I think I think this is a potential to reduce the uh, the damage that could be done. I mean that's why it's important to follow these these recommendations. So I'll just real quickly, just wash your hands, practice social distancing, clean surfaces with disinfectant. Uh, don't touch your face. Um, don't uh, after touching other surfaces. Um, don't touch your face again. And if you feel the onset of symptoms, go uh, seek uh, uh, medical advice from a healthcare provider. So I think those are the those are the, are the basics. I think we'll get through this. I'm I'm of the opinion that I'd rather for our MCN group that in six months we look back and say, wow, we were really super cautious, maybe too cautious. That's okay by me. I'd rather do that than six months from now say, man, I wish we were a little more cautious. We we kind of let some things slip by, by here. So that's my personal philosophy, and um, I'm going to try to practice that myself and with my patients. Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Medeiros and Amy. Amy Lieben, um, we are here again with Facebook Live on Children in the Fields campaign. We just finished um, our questions that we had prepared. Now we'll move into a time of question and answer from the audience. Um, and Dr. Medeiros, we understand if you can't stay for this, um, but if you can, we're more than welcome. Well, here my, my beeper hasn't gone off yet, so I'm still Great. good. Okay, so the first question that we have is from Guadalupe. Um, and I think a, a few other people asked this was, can either speaker address safety precautions for farm workers who commute in groups, groups and vans or buses to work? And I think, Amy, I think you touched on this a little bit. Um, and I think there was another like related question, like how, what are these adjustments that need to be made to the living conditions to prevent the spread? Okay, uh, so I'll, I'll uh, re repeat a little bit here. So the, our, the way that our current system is set up where how farm workers might generally be transported or how they generally might be housed needs to change and we need to advocate for that. And, and again, I wanna underscore, I recognize that, that I, I'm suggesting potentially what we see as the impossible on a regular day, but we're in a crisis and maybe there's an opportunity for that. So um, what we would like to see is if there is um, crowded uh, transportation that we try to implement social distancing, even within that transportation. So we're not cramming workers together in, in a small van. Um, maybe there's multiple trips, but we need to disinfect um, between trips and we need to make sure that um, workers are not on top of each other in transportation. I know I'm, I, I, it's, that's a hard ask, but that's what is needed. In terms of housing, um, what we would really like to see is the social distancing that workers are kept um, six, six feet apart with, with their, their bedding, um, that we don't have a lot of workers um, together in, in one room, that um, there is a room reserved for potentially sick workers. And that um, this might be kind of interesting because of the poor housing, maybe there are uh, cracks and whatnot, but we want, we want ventilation um, available. And so particularly if you're a sick worker, 
we want that worker to be um, near near a window, um, and if it's possible um, with with the weather um, to keep to keep fresh air uh, flowing in. Um, we need to have um, resources available so that our farm workers can practice safe hygiene practices. We want to have them to have soap and water available to them. We want farm workers to have um, uh, disinfection um, measures in place in their housing so that the, there's the same things that we're all doing in, in our houses are happening in, in farm worker housing. And again, I, I, I know I keep saying this, I know these are hard asks, but we all have a responsibility um, to do this and, and our, our growers who I know um, want their crops picked and we as a public want food that is coming from our farm workers, we need to be pushing for, for these recommendations and keeping this incredibly valuable workforce as healthy as possible. Absolutely. Um, would those recommendations apply then in the fields when they're working, like during their rest periods and when they're, they're eating and resting? Um, Absolutely. Um, in, in some ways, um, when you think about farm work, um, when we think about an open field, there, there, there may likely be space for um, that, that, six, that six feet, um, where in other industries that, that might be harder. So that, that's an area where there is potential where one of the recommendations might be a little bit easier than, let's say, in a factory setting. Um, but on breaks, um, just like the rest of us, we need to maintain that social distancing. And again, you know, the, the whole soap and water piece of this, this is something that already is required. Um, so this is not, we are not asking for, um, we're not moving a mountain here to ask for soap and water. That, that is already required, should be required. And, and now more than ever, um, our farm workers need to have access to those resources and understand the importance of, of the uh, safe hygiene practices. Yes, I agree. Um, I, a follow-up question from Guadalupe was that in California, she's been seeing increasing numbers of people who test positive and the fat fatalities, but there have been no confirmed cases among the farm workers. And she's asking, is that because they're less at risk? Is it different in other states? Well, the question is, <laughs> yeah. So, so the question is, are people being tested in, in that community also? Because there's there's a really, um, <clears throat> this is one of the challenges we have right now is that we haven't done a whole lot of testing to the American population to know discrete groups or parts of the, uh, we have started testing, but we don't have a good numerator. And we also don't have a big denominator of people who, who have tested positive, but maybe have milder symptoms. So both the numerator and the denominator as an epidemiologist, that makes it very challenging then to figure out what is actually happening. So if you don't get tested, everybody's feeling pretty healthy. Well, sometimes our, our farm workers are generally on the younger side of, uh, and, and they may be able to be positive without being very sick. That's the other concern that we have. So some people may be just carriers and uh, not be that sick. So the question back to Guadalupe would be, do we have, um, are those migrants tested or are they feeling so good that they're not going to be tested? Because, you know, to test somebody when they're feeling fine and go all the way, all the way to the clinic or wherever and come back again and take a day off work when you're feeling fine, that's just not something I see being done right now. It may be done, but I don't see it being done. So I, I don't have an answer to that in terms of knowing how many people are actually infected but not feeling very sick at this time. And just to add on to that, well, basically, um, we know that this is a very contagious virus. Um, we know that we have to take measures um, to prevent the spread. Um, so recognizing that in the United States, we, we, we simply have been behind on the testing piece of it. So because we don't have X amount of confirmed cases, means we just, we, we don't, we don't know. Um, so again, what we have to fall back on is the importance of getting the safety messages out there and putting safe practices into place. Um, that That's the best that we can do right now. And so because we don't know about confirmed cases, we do know that we have farm workers living in potentially crowded spaces. And so therefore we, we know that they're at risk and we know that we need to do these preventative measures. Yes, exactly. Um, 
A question from JD Jordan is that he works, or she, sorry, um, work with many undocumented folks in the Central Valley of California. We're hearing that folks are losing jobs, unable to pay their bills, can't get clean drinking water, no childcare, et cetera. Many aren't eligible for unemployment insurance. So the, the core question is what other resources can undocumented folks get right now to handle day-to-day -day needs and costs? That, that's a good question that I sadly don't have a, a great answer for us. Um, we've entered this crisis um, we've entered it with an already very broken system where our farm workers have been excluded from many of the safety nets that we need all workers to have. So it, it's a very challenging situation. My, the only thing I can say at, at this moment, and we will keep looking for the resources and keep trying to find the answers, is that this may be something at the local community where we can look to our, our, our local philanthropists um, to, to help out um, in these situations. And I'm sorry, I, I don't have a better answer for you. Um, and the only silver lining in this whole crisis is that maybe we have an opportunity to understand that unemployment insurance, that paid sick leave, that these worker benefits are not worker benefits. They are public health measures and they need to be applied to all workers, regardless of their documentation status and regardless of the type of work that they do. Again, I, I know what the reality is out there and that that's might not be realistic, but as a result of our broken system, we're, we're, we're gonna see some of the most valuable workers that we need right now further disenfranchised and uh, the best advice we can give right now is to, to look for local sources to support them. Yeah, I agree completely with Amy here. And one of the local sources we have in South Central Pennsylvania is we have a, a large group of religious communities here that really do help at least their members and they do some outreach. And so anytime we've had a, a crisis in the past, and certainly this is one of the biggest ones we've had, um, the the spiritual community in, in in our area has the distance to help people. So that again, that varies from place to place in the United States, but that's another one of the sources. But I, I do agree with Amy that you know, it's a broken system already. And this is highlighting that fact because, you know, so many people are in need right now. Um, all, all types of uh, workers are in need right now. And this is going to hit hardest on those that are most vulnerable, which is the, the case in, in our callers the question. Those, those are the most vulnerable people right now. Okay, so moving on to the next question um, from Maria Hernandez and uh, also Grace Cube asked a similar one. It seems that our community health services is reducing their outreach and this creates a huge issue if our older farm workers come to our state with already existing health conditions, no insurance, no health services. We need to keep providing services even if it's on a reduced basis, not eliminating them. How can we do this? That's another, another great question. Um, our healthcare providers, whether they are an outreach worker or community health worker or the, the specialist in the hospital, our, our clinicians are on, on the front line. And I know a lot of organizations are doing their best to, to keep their clinicians safe. Um, however, um, we know that we also need to be advocating for ways instead of eliminating the service, what are the alternative ways? How can we think out of the box? How can we get this messaging um, to our farm workers? How can we do train the trainer type type efforts? Like, like the, we need to, uh, as we re pull back um, and um, want to make sure that we're all protected, we need to understand that we also have to recognize that we have folks that still need us out there. And so, figuring out those solutions and, and working hand in hand um, with the entities that are set up is gonna be really important. I don't have great answers. It's very decentralized. Each organization makes their own decisions um, about how to do that. But I think underscoring um, the need and letting them know about the need and figuring out alternative ways um, in this time is needed as opposed to simply eliminating 
Yeah, and our community also, right now, the medical community is trying to triage the people who need the care the most. So what's happening right now is that routine exams or well-child evaluations are, are being postponed and opening up uh, time slots for our clinicians to then serve the community that needs them most. And there are still outreach people that, that now will have a little bit more time because we've reduced the outpatient in the outpatient setting the kind of the, the routine things that we want to continue ultimately but for now we're suspending so that will free up clinicians to triage the, the most vulnerable and i agree those those patients are the most vulnerable now on the other hand we have an elderly population and we're trying to isolate them also because we know that some of us would be younger and healthier and seeing them or visiting them may put them at additional risk if we are unknown carriers of, of this uh, COVID-19. And so there's an act there to try to protect the elderly who are at home to you know stay isolated for the 14 days or however long that they need to be. Um, so what, what has been happening is that people have been bringing food outside to the porch or something to, to help. And then um, the families who are inside come in and take that uh, food or nutrition or medicine or whatever that that's needed um, but that's that's not a great solution but for now that's one of the things that we're we're trying to do um, so both and, to protect the elderly and, and also to not get them totally isolated yeah. and i encourage all of us that are, are listening right now um through social media to share best practices that are working in this and i think we need to recognize that this is just an unprecedented crisis for, for many of us. And, and we're trying to figure it out as we go. We're trying to stay calm, um, use evidence-based approaches, um, not instill fear, have good sources, but it, it's, it's new. To, it's new. Um, and and, and um, I think that we need to be, while we need to be physically distant, we need to be in social solidarity and we need to be sharing um, our best practices and what's working and, and figuring out innovative ways to be able to, to help our farm worker community. And I know we've gone a little longer than expected. I just have one last question um, about underlying health conditions from a few, from a few people are asking this, like workers who have those underlying health conditions such as asthma, diabetes, um, and some others, I don't remember, the, streams going by so fast what would you recommend for them would they be best off staying home i i think for now if if they're healthy and their and their comorbid conditions we call comorbid conditions are uh well controlled they can still continue to work there i have many diabetic patients that are, are very healthy and otherwise are you know they're actually eating nutritionally better than some of my other patients because they have diabetes and so if it's well controlled and they're not sick they can certainly work but just know that that they're more vulnerable so if they do get sick they're the ones we need to uh, triage first so I, I think at this point don't don't take them out of uh, commission at, at this time um, but if they start to get sick and we know that diabetes can can make you a little bit more vulnerable certain things where patients who are immunocompromised their immune systems aren't quite as strong if they had leukemia or recent uh, bone marrow transplant or kidney transplant, any of those kind of things where your immune system is more compromised than those I would, I would say don't work now. Because if your immune system is already compromised and we know it, then those are people who shouldn't be working. People who have diabetes but have good control over it, hypertension with good control, I think those people could continue to work at this point. Um, if I find any evidence to the contrary, I will let you know and we'll have another one of these talks and update you further. But that's as far as I know right now, I think that's still best practice. Great. Thank you so much. I think that's all the questions that we're going to take for now. Um, we thank Dr. Medeiros and Amy Lieben for joining us today. We really, really appreciate it. Um, and, all and of your insights. Kendra, I, I just I just want to say thank you so much to you as well. But I also want to tell our, our listeners that um, our, our website, migrantclinician.org, um, our blog is a great way to keep up with some uh, really thought out um, resources and, and information. And, and we're, we're, we are a trusted source. And so I, I do encourage you to share 
your best practices with us and, uh, and also look to us um, for information and resources. And it's migrantclinician.org. Uh, and we um, wish all of us solidarity and support in, in this battle. And most of all, um, we, we want to support and be there for um, our farm workers. Definitely. Um, thank you, Amy. Thank you, Dr. Medeiros. And also thank you to, um, I think Claire was from MCN answering a lot yeah, of the she, questions. Claire had she put something up there too on, on DocuFund, maybe a resource for yes. California uh, for people who are unemployed during this pandemic. So Claire's a great resource. She's one of our editors and uh, a very valued member of our community and, and migrant clinician network. And uh, she puts out a blog all the time. She keeps up to date and she's very um, conscientious about putting out the best information that is, you know, the clearest and, and possible. So um, we rely on her. She has, she's a great resource there. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. Um, I'll close with those five suggestions, five recommendations that Dr. Madaris mentioned a little bit ago. And that is number one, wash your hands. Number two, practice social distancing. Number three, clean surfaces with disinfectant. Wipes don't do it. It's just a spray. Um, is that right? Got that right? <laughs> That's what I read anyways. Um, number four, don't touch your face. Not touching my face. <laughs> number five, if you feel the onset of any COVID-19 symptoms like fever, cough, shortness of breath, obtain testing at your nearest medical facility. So that is all from us. And we will see you next time, 1230 next Thursday. We'll have another guest. We'll not, not sure who yet at this point, but um, we were very happy to have Migrant Clinicians Network on with us today. So thank you so much, everybody. Thank, thank you for having you. us. Bye-bye.